Bien, bonjour à toutes et à tous pour celles et ceux qui nous rejoignent. Good afternoon. On a few words in uh, French first. So this session is going to be about uh, sustainable development pathways, and we are going to address political and social issues most. Uh, and we'll talk about issues such as how can we define uh, desirable future or a desirable state for nature and society on, on the long run. So these are the questions we are going to address and therefore we'll address issues around inequalities, uh, uh, fairness and political feasibility of these uh, sustainable pathways that we're trying to build. As an example, AFD is working in different countries such as Vietnam and others and beyond setting an objective that may sometimes be inspired from science, we immediately are faced with issues around cost and political viability of a pathway. So today we'll talk about obstacles to defining and achieving these pathways. We also work in totally different contexts, some being uh, demo democratic contexts, others not. But in any case, social feasibility issue questions are raised uh, according to different uh, timelines sometimes, but the nature of a political regime does not make uh, a society, the cultural aspects of a society disappear. Of uh, trajectories, but also their uh, socio uh, and political fundamentals, and how, uh, what, what kind of obstacles uh, are going to be met along the way. Uh, we'll have uh, three panelists today. We are going to start with uh, Marc uh, Fleurbet. Uh, Marc is a director de recherche, research director within the CNRS, the, the National Institute uh, uh, for, for Research in France. And uh, Marc, you will uh, in particular. Uh, study the, um, uh, I mean, several, we through several angles, uh, the um, uh, topics of equity between and uh, amongst generations, and you will try to uh, study how uh, these particular matters can or not uh, deter, prevent, or the, the realization of a sustainable trajectory. So uh, later on, we'll, uh, we will uh, uh, listen to Bruno Boisdin. Bruno is a professor of economics at Centre Lillois d'études et de recherche sociologique et économique, Claire C. Uh, and, uh, and last but not least, uh, we will have with us uh, online uh, Dr. Laura Carvalho, uh, who is the director, hello Laura, we, we, we see you on screen, and happily so, uh, director of, uh, of equity at the Open Society Foundation and associate Prof professor of economics at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, where you will uh, discuss the impact of structural transformation on inequalities in Latin America and the employment effects of green transition plans in the regions. So first we start with, with Mark. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed. So I would like to, um, uh, to speak about the possible tension between social and environmental concerns that we may have. Um, so um, the, um, thank you for, for setting up the slides. And, um, there is um, a tension, so a tension that uh, has some obvious dimensions. Um, um, ministries are competing for our priorities, uh, so the social ministry and the environmental ministry are, are competing. Um, and so it's, uh, it's uh, something that is in the mind of everyone. The, uh, in France, uh, the Yellow Vest movement has uh, really uh, made it clear that we uh, can't completely uh, forget the social issues when we deal with environmental priorities. But also, we see at the global level uh, that similarly uh, the development needs of some countries uh, can be a very serious impediment in uh, gathering uh, coalitions uh, in order to, uh, to develop initiatives for the environment. But there is another tension that is more familiar to the field I'm uh, working in, which is the evaluation of public policies and social welfare in societies. And it's a sort of more basic tension between the social and the environmental. And this has to do with the fact that if we make efforts to preserve the environment, the main beneficiaries of these efforts will be future generations, will be people living in the future, uh, at least in a few decades, but even in a few centuries. And the efforts for that, of course, will fall on the current generation. And um, if things are not totally catastrophic, we can hope that the future generations will be at least as affluent as we are and possibly more affluent than we are. And so if they are richer than the current generations, 
The efforts we make now are efforts that we make for richer people than us. And so there is a, a very deep uh, potential uh, tension between uh, the uh, social priority for the worse off, that is quite popular in policy evaluation, and the ecological uh, imperative. And so sometimes I describe this as a sort of Green New Deal dilemma, uh, tension between the components of this, of this deal. Um, now, uh, this dilemma can be um, assuaged to some extent. So there are ways in which, in fact, the tension is not so deep, and in, in reality, you have synergies between the two things. Synergies which can possibly help with the political difficulties, the obstacles uh, that were mentioned in the introduction to this, to this session. So there is first the issue of intragenerational inequalities, right? So I was talking about the future generation be to being richer than us, but in fact, uh, all generations have inequalities at, uh, between countries, also within countries. And so if you look at the environmental impacts of uh, uh, various uh, things, but in particular climate change uh, and biodiversity loss, uh, the distributions are very unequal and, and will fall on uh, the most vulnerable and the most exposed population who happen to be, uh, to be the poorest in, uh, uh, in terms of geographical distribution, but also within uh, geographical regions, uh, the, 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 usually the poorest um, social groups. Now, um, we can also, uh, we have also to look at the uh, distribution of abatement cost or uh, efforts uh, of environmental uh, policies. And here we have, of course, um, a lot of leeway. We do have uh, some policy uh, degrees of freedom also in adaptation. So the distribution of impacts is not just a natural thing. It's also partly a policy issue. Uh, but obviously, the distribution of efforts is uh, primarily a policy, uh, policy issue. And finally, I would like to mention something that economists uh, tend to uh, put a little bit uh, on the side usually, but is, uh, is the issue of voice, giving voice to people. And here, uh, inequalities can be quite important as well. And we are uh, very conscious, I'm sure, in this room, that it's, uh, it's very important to, uh, to really have a, a representative uh, way of making uh, decisions for all these dimensions of adaptation and mitigation uh, policies. So, um, as I was saying, it's popular in the field of policy evaluation to have a specific uh, or a special priority for the worse off. Um, and uh, there is a sort of uh, uh, way to summarize that, which is to say that the policy is as good as uh, it is seen from the viewpoint of the worse off or even the worst off uh, in the worst case scenario. So when you combine inequalities and risk, uh, it's really what, uh, what happens in the worst scenario that matters and what happens to the worst off in society. And um, this uh, is obviously uh, something that makes sense when you believe in the need to have a high priority for the worst off in your evaluation. But it turns out that even if you don't believe in such a high, um, and that is something that is in such a high priority for the worst off, that is something that is not obvious. And I will not try to give you the mathematical proof of why this is true, but, um, but it turns out that when you do an evaluation of long-term policies with very long-term impact in terms of decades, even centuries, uh, then uh, you have to uh, compare the values of these benefits and costs in the future with the current values. And so you do some, some discounting exercise in order to do that. So this is a, uh, sometimes contro uh, controversial and discussed. But you have to do some kind of comparison between the future values and the current values. And when you do that, it turns out that what happens to the worst off in the worst case scenario is always something that will determine your key parameters of evaluation, and especially this comparison between the future values and the present values. So the, uh, what is called the discount rate. So the long-term discount rate depends on what happens to the worst off in the worst case scenario essentially no matter how much social priority you want to give to the worse off. Okay? So that's something that is really in the nature of the long term. Um, and, um, and so if we introduce all these considerations and these uh, issues of inequalities, distribution of costs, distribution of impact, uh, you can easily uh, reconcile the social and the environmental because you can uh, make it the case that the um, social efforts and social benefits of the, uh, of the policies are really uh, acceptable and, uh, and can lead to a preservation of the, of the environment. And so, um, especially we're all uh, concerned, and uh, you've heard people already talking about the risk uh, of, uh, um, uh, of increase in extreme poverty coming from environmental damages and impacts. 
um, and, and also uh, indirect factors like um, uh, public health issues and so on, um, and also conflicts which can be triggered by, uh, by the environmental stress and other, other forms of uh, environmental pressures. Um, so if we, if we really uh, look at these uh, threats on extreme poverty, uh, it's uh, very important to preserve the environment in order to alleviate these threats on uh, this risk of, uh, of increased extreme poverty. Now, um, that leaves open the question of how to uh, decide about the distribution of these efforts. Um, and, um, and here uh, there, is, uh, there are various considerations. I will not uh, propose a solution. I would just like to put on the table a few uh, considerations. Um, and in particular, uh, there is um, a concern about cost effectiveness of the policies that is uh, quite typical of, uh, especially of, of the economics profession. Um, and here, uh, this may clash a little bit with concerns about responsibility, for instance, for pollution, for, uh, for environmental degradations. Um, and, um, and there is um, a first consideration that I would like to mention, which is that if we really wanted to, um, to minimize the total cost over the world of our effort to preserve the environment, uh, that would typically induce an, a very high burden on the poorest populations. Um, and so the uh, ideal of um, cost effectiveness or minimizing the total cost is something that is uh, really oblivious to, uh, to the, uh, the difficulties for uh, the people for whom um, uh, reaching a certain level of a marginal cost of abatement would imply a very, very uh, high uh, effort. And now if we uh, combine uh, this uh, with uh, some uh, transfers to equalize the relative burden in, uh, for instance, the proportion of GDP that is devoted to these efforts for various, um, various countries, um, that would uh, require uh, amounts of transfers that would be uh, so high that they are probably unimaginable, uh, especially on the side of rich countries which would have to pay, uh, to pay for these transfers. And so, um, uh, the issue of transfers is, of course, uh, quite um, controversial and difficult. Uh, we've heard a lot of that uh, around the COP27 discussions. Uh, some breakthroughs have been made, but uh, probably um, words and, uh, and deeds and acts will, will, will differ. Uh, so pledges always have to be checked at some point. Um, but but we, we do see that transfers are already planned. And so some combination of, um, of uh, accepting that we want completely minimize the cost because we will allow some uh, diversity of, uh, of, um, of, of burden sharing across countries uh, and we will not equalize marginal cost. Uh, accepting uh, to have a cost that is globally a little higher than, than it could be, but combined with some uh, limited amount of transfers can be uh, a pragmatic compromise between these two, uh, these two problems. I would like to give you two examples of this sort of uh, analysis. First, um, uh, an example uh, where I will show uh, the results from a paper that is uh, looking at this issue in terms of global distribution and looks at how uh, combining these limited transfers with uh, some uh, unequal marginal cost uh, that uh, remain progressive in the sense that more efforts will be asked in terms of marginal cost from the rich countries can, uh, can uh, somehow uh, help to uh, preserve uh, equal uh, relative burden and some equity. And, and then a second example with national um, efforts that can be uh, distributed in a way that uses, for instance, the carbon tax revenues to uh, compensate uh, the uh, various households. And that can be done in a very, very basic way, uh, the, most, the simplest way you could imagine, a lump sum, a uniform lump sum transfer across households. This is a formula that has been proposed by some conservative groups in the US. Uh, so it's not something that is uh, politically uh, uh, very unacceptable to, uh, to, to the, the whole political spectrum um, and, and is worth considering. So let me just show you the, these examples very briefly. So this is from a, a paper by uh, Bauer and, and co-authors um, that uh, analyzes the, uh, this issue of burden sharing across countries. And I would like you just to focus on the three um, columns uh, on the right, so you have the first uh, column, on, so on the left of the, the, the leftmost column on, on the right, is the one where you would have a uniform marginal cost, and that would be implemented, for instance, with a, a single a uniform carbon tax all over the world. Okay, so that would minimize the abatement cost for a carbon mitigation policy. 
Um, and there would be no transfer across countries. And you have the cost that this represents for the countries in uh, total uh, money terms. Uh, so the dark colors, uh, bluish colors, are the rich countries. And the other countries are the, uh, the emerging and, and poorer countries. And so you see that the, the cost is distributed in a way that is uh, absolutely staggering for the poor countries. Now, uh, the same uh, system of a uniform carbon tax could be accompanied with transfers that would restore proportionality of abatement uh, efforts to the GDP of the countries. And that's the second column in this series. So if you compare the second column to the first, you see that the, the amount of transfers that this would require uh, is absolutely uh, staggering for the rich countries. They would have to transfer a lot of money to the poor countries, and I let you imagine the political difficulty about that. So the third column is the compromise, the pragmatic compromise. That is something that allows for differentiated carbon taxes. So you would have lower carbon taxes in poor countries and higher in rich countries. And you have these uh, levels of carbon taxes or carbon prices in the graph on the right, on the left of the, so the, the dots on the left represent what would happen in terms of the various carbon taxes. But of course, when you do that, you lose the cost effectiveness. So you have a total cost of the policy that is higher than could be. And that's why the third uh, column is higher than the first two. Um, but the, 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 the waste that is induced by that is not that great, right? It's not uh, so, so important. And so maybe that's a kind of reasonable compromise we could think about. The other example that I wanted to give you is uh, about a paper that I've done with co-authors, um, and which is about this idea of uh, um, a carbon fee and dividend, where you redistribute the carbon tax dividend, uh, the carbon tax revenues, as a uniform lump sum transfer to all households. And we imagine doing that in all the 12 regions and so the transfers would, be, would, be, uh, would stay within the 12 regions of the RICE model, which is an integrated assessment model uh, that uh, William Nordhaus has, uh, has developed. But we have uh, uh, enriched this model by introducing inequalities within the regions. And so we can describe what happens within the, within the regions themselves. So you have the 12 regions here. So sorry, a lot, of, uh, a lot of curves on this graph. The only thing you have to look at is that the fact that the uh, solid curves are above the dashed curves. So the dash curves are what happens when there is no redistribution of, um, of the carbon tax revenue. Essentially, uh, the people bear um, the, uh, the, the tax and, and uh, there is no, no, no redistribution at all. So it's, the burden is somehow proportional to people's uh, income, more or less. Um, and then you see that the social welfare, so there is a measure of social welfare to summarize the situation in each of these regions. So we see that the scenario is a scenario of we make a lot of effort for a long time, essentially all the century, and it's only after we've reached the end of the century that we see the benefits of these policies. Okay? But if you do the redistribution, that's when, that's when you have the solid curves. And the solid curves are, for many regions, above zero for a long time. And that's thanks to the carbon tax revenue that is used. Right? At some point, it plunges below zero. Why that? Well, because when we decarbonize enough, then the carbon tax revenues dwindle and disappear at some point, right? And so we can no longer benefit from this redistribution. And that's why it goes down. But you see, it goes down in the middle of the century. And that's at a time when, uh, with ho hopefully some growth, uh, people will be less, uh, less burdened by these efforts to make. So the, the, the every, all these curves, of course, are in comparison to, to business as usual, right? So uh, you see that uh, you, there is a background growth that is going behind. This is not an absolute level. Okay, the final uh, consideration I wanted to mention before concluding with uh, more general considerations about sustainability is the, the idea that um, what really matters in terms of for the, the, um, uh, for the uh, uh, fine-tuning of carbon policies um, is the question of whether the, the countries or the regions implement some protection of the uh, populations that are impacted by climate damages. And so here you have uh, an example of two regions in the world that are pretty unequal, the USA and Latin America. And you have uh, carbon prices that would be uh, optimal in the model for these two regions. And you have curves which uh, don't differ very much. And these are curves that correspond to what would be the optimal carbon uh, tax, depending on whether there is no inequality in the region, hypothetically, or whether we keep the uh, inequality as it is, but the, uh, the impacts of climate damages on the population 
are compensated by adaptation policies inside the regions, right? So the, essentially, the current inequality is not worsened by, uh, by, the, um, uh, by the climate impacts. Uh, and then you see you don't have much of a difference. But um, what happens, so you have curves which are much higher for the two regions, so these dotted curves which are much higher, and that corresponds to the case in which there is no such policy of protecting populations from the climate impact. And that's when uh, the carbon uh, price should be much higher because the, carbon, the, the, uh, the mitigation policy is a way to protect the vulnerable populations against these uh, climate impacts. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the main message of this thing. I would like to conclude by general considerations about sustainability. I hope I will not be too provocative, but uh, this is a conference about sustainability, and I would like to, um, to, to raise two doubts about this notion. So the first one is that uh, sometimes, uh, very often, statisticians and economists alike would want to assess sustainability just by looking at the current data. Uh, so many indicators claim to be based only on current data. Uh, and that is true for ecological footprint indicators, for inclusive wealth indicators. But in fact, they, uh, such indicators cannot, uh, in good uh, sense, cannot really uh, be uh, constructed without forward-looking analysis forward-looking scenarios, right? You need to know what will happen in the future. You need to know what will be the needs of the future generations in order to assess whether what we do now is responsible or not. And so uh, I think we should really uh, push for uh, much more attention to uh, scenarios uh, and not just uh, hope that we can have in the simple indicators that will tell us if what we do now is, um, is responsible. And finally, uh, even a more general and a bit negative uh, consideration about sustainability. I was born at a time when there was a hope in unlimited progress. We were very naive uh, this time. I'm older than many people in this room. Uh, that was very naive. And so the, the discovery of the planetary boundaries has been obviously bad news. We have to accommodate the needs of the planet and not just our, our needs. Um, okay, that's true. But, uh, but just uh, uh, focusing on sustainability and the idea of maintaining what we have for the future the future generations, is a sort of uh, very big regress from the idea of uh, unlimited progress we had before. So let's try to find something in between. We can still hope to do something better for the future generations. We can have smart policies and we can promote human and planetary well-being. So let's try to dream and to invent uh, positive futures. Uh, many efforts have been done in this direction, uh, but I really would like to, to say that this should be done and we should not just uh, focus and uh, be obsessed with sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lamont. And we certainly don't think that building scenarios is, uh, is provocative, since we just published today <laughs> a research paper at AFD is based on uh, estimating scenarios, uh, in particular for biodiversity in, uh, in France. And so certainly it's one way to build trajectories to, be, uh, uh, to, to allow to just to measure the contradictions between or the tensions between uh, uh, economic, social and environmental uh, objectives. So now we're going to listen to uh, Bruno Boisdin. You will again discuss these tensions uh, with uh, case studies. Uh, I think in particular in Africa, but uh, yes. we'll uh, be happy to listen to your talk, uh, dear Bruno. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry for my English, it's average. We'll see. I will do my best. It's uh, translated oh. though, so you can speak in French if you want. Oh no, I prefer to try in English. <laughs> Only try. So the title of my presentation is A Strong Sustainability Trajectory in the South, Needs and Obstacles. The case of Africa. I won't propose you a model or a turnkey approach of what we have to do. I will only try to, uh, from the point of view of a social economist, what can be the link between the macro level, the meso level, and the local level in Africa. I'm not an African, as you can see, but I will try. Uh, my presentation will be uh, divided in two points. The first point will be to, to uh, say the same thing at the beginning, uh, which means uh, the compliance between social and environmental sustainability. It's a big challenge, compliance between social and environmental sustainability. Thank you. And the second point will be uh, another perspective from the bottom, because the first perspective will be uh, at a macro level. 
So, uh, the focal point, uh, compliance between social and environmental sustainability. Um, in, the, in the macroeconomic literature, in general, uh, they find that, I'm not a macroeconomist, so I, I say they, right? they find that um, there is an incompatibility between uh, social targets and environmental targets in the, in the South, in the South. For example, in, in, a, in a recent study uh, of Rougier Combarnou Pifto, it will be published in a very good review, which is called Mons en Développement, uh, in one month. The key idea is that uh, social and environmental sustainability are compliant in the Sustainable Development Goals. They are theoretically compliant, but incompatible in practice. Uh, to, to demonstrate this idea, they make they make a factor analysis. You see on the figure, you don't see it, but I explain you. You see on the figure that on the left, you have some countries with a good uh, environmental sustainability. And on the right, you have other countries with a good or something better for the social sustainability. And uh, to demonstrate that, they, they use a, a factor analysis on uh, 94 developing countries in Asia, Africa, and uh, Latin America. And they use uh, se several criteria I, I don't develop. Um, and they find another interesting thing in that uh, they try to classify different kind of uh, development worlds. And they, they find five development worlds. I will focus only on the one and the four, because actually, African countries are concentrated in the world one and world four. Um, the world one is a world in which countries uh, have succeeded in attaining uh, investment, productivity, um, integration to uh, global value chains, and so on. So good macroeconomic indicators. But they don't succeed in attaining good environmental indicators. They succeed in some, but not in others. And in, in the case of social indicators, it's bad. It's not good. The world four is uh, a world in which countries are poorer and they underperform in all the, all the dimensions, economic, social, but they have good results in terms of environment. Because actually, uh, it, it's uh, an intuitive result. Uh, the intuitive result is we have to choose between social goals and environmental goals. We are obliged to destroy environment to attain uh, social goals. Uh, moreover, uh, these results are close to the donut theory. I don't know if you know the donut theory of Kate Rowers. It's not really a theory. It's a grid of analysis, I would say. Uh, Kate Rowers proposed to, uh, to, 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 to represent countries uh, in a circle. Inside the circle, you have got social targets. And outside the circle, you've got the environmental pressure you put on the, on the environment. And for example, there are here two very different countries, Benin, which is a very poor country. In Benin, they don't uh, reach social goals. Inside the circle, you have a lot of red or rose, and, but they don't put a lot of pressure on the environment. In South Africa, we have talked a lot of South Africa uh, today, South Africa is very lucky because there are a lot of experts who talk about South Africa. In South Africa, they are better in terms of social targets inside the circle, but, but they put a lot of pressure on the environment. To finish the first part, we can add that uh, there is another incompatibility. Because what we can say that in the last 30 years, Three models have inspired the advice given to poor countries. The first model is a move towards globalization in the 80s and the 90s. The second model is move towards human development with the Millennium Development Goals. And the third model is move towards sustainable development, more specifically environment, with the Sustainable Development Goals. But what is shown by a lot of macroeconomic studies, and the study of Combarnou Rougier shows the same thing, is that the first advice, uh, move towards globalization, seems contradictory with the last two. Uh, good performance in terms of integration into world markets, global value chains, 
contradicts with preservation of biodiversity and, to a lesser extent, with food self-sufficiency and satisfaction of basic needs. Therefore, moving towards globalization does not seem, does not seem to be a solution to sustainability issues. So now I will propose another perspective from the bottom. Um, and I will try to explain that it's not the best perspective. perspective. It's only a complementary perspective of uh, other perspectives. Um, beyond the, the incompatibility, uh, actually, we can say that, that there is a weak sustainability. There is a, a social choice or a collective choice of a weak sustainability trajectory. Uh, incompatibility between social and environmental sustainability uh, in fact, uh, is observed, uh, but it is not theorized. Uh, it is not logically demonstrated. It isn't based on a theoretical demonstration. Um, furthermore, it only takes into account macroeconomic objectives in a globalized economy, but not local achievements, because these local achievements are barely visible. And I think there is a need for a meso-micro approach or a meso-local approach to, com to be complementary with a macro-level approach. That is what I propose now. Um, this uh, meso-local approach can be uh, seen uh, with, for example, the relocated economy movement. The relocated economy movement, the movement to, which tries to relocate the economies. Uh, is based on many field uh, experiences. For example, I give here the example of the Songhai Farm in Bénin. The Songhai Farm is, a, is an experience of agroecology which try to create a local job, a local food for local consumers. So actually, it, it's a kind of circular economy based on agroecology. Uh, another example is the Letri du Berger, Shepherd's Dairy in Senegal, which is uh, what Mohamed Yunus would, would call social business. It's a, uh, it tries to um, uh, replace uh, imported powder milk by local produced milk. So it, it gives an added value, uh, a social added value, I would say, because it creates, uh, it creates um, local revenues, local jobs. And it's good for children who lack of good milk. And the, the third example of these experiences in Africa is uh, the development of experiences of circular economy in Cameroon, in Coast, Ivory Coast. I can develop, but I don't have time to, to develop a lot. Um, of course, a challenge uh, for these experiences is uh, to go beyond the storytelling. Um, and a perspective I can propose, I propose, is to develop the implementation uh, of this relocated economy with the One Health approach. I will explain it later. The mobilization of the One Health approach, so the, the One Health approach is an approach in which we consider the interactions between human health, animal health, and the environment. For example, uh, in the case of uh, COVID-19 COVID uh, pandemics, so you see that the degradation, the deforestation in some countries has led to uh, the fact that animals uh, live closer to human people and so they transmit a virus called COVID-19. But of course they transmit a lot of other viruses that is what we call zoonose. So everything is linked, but it's not a new idea. It's only a grid of analysis that we can use. I would say it's a, a grid of analysis without the economy. So. As I am an economist, I add economy in this grid of analysis. But one of the obstacles of the One Health approach is the scattering of initiatives and their invisibility. Um, their scale of intervention is uh, a barrier because uh, generally, generally, uh, donors uh, and aid actors uh, take into account international, regional and national actors. Except maybe AFD. I don't see. I don't say that because I am in the AFD. But for example, um, I have read a report of uh, Sabine Duhamel uh, one or two years ago, uh, which tries to evaluate one health approach applied to Senegal and Guinea. I think agroecology in Senegal and Guinea. So there is a 
a debut of something ab about uh, One Health. Um, we, we can see uh, the case of agroecology, for example, in Cameroon, with uh, the cocoa sector. It's a, it's a, a very good thesis of uh, Gérard Baïa, which is a uh, Cameroonese uh, researcher. Uh, and Gérard Baïa tries to broaden the approach of One Health by adding planet, um, plant health. So, of course, he says, if plant health is good, plants can protect themselves against sickness and they can improve the environment, the animal health, and, of course, the human health. Um, the results of the survey show how the transition towards uh, sustainability in the cocoa sector is compromised by a short-term view, I would say by a, a, a weak sustainability view. Because to deal with the devastating consequences of exposure of plants to disease, uh, the use of chemical fertilizers is accelerated. So it is a vicious circle because as a consequence, of course, the ability of plants to protect themselves is being reduced. The more you use chemical fertilizers, the less plants are able to protect themselves without chemical fertilizers. The lessons to be learned are, and it's my conclusion, I am very short today. More time for the questions. The lessons to be learned are, uh, first, uh, an unsustainable system accelerates the use of unsustainable techniques. There is a past dependency to chemical fertilizers. This helps to explain why at a macro level, it's my hypothesis, maybe I make a mistake, but it's my hypothesis, we can discuss about it. Uh, at a macro level, social and environmental sustainability seem incompatible. In the studies, in general, they seem to be incompatible. In fact, I think that they seem to be incompatible because of the choice of indicators and because of the choice of a weak sustainability trajectory in a lot of African countries. If you see at a lower level, at a local level, you see a lot of experiences like agroecology, which shows which with uh, agroecology it's possible to improve health, access to food without destroying environment. So, of course, there is a gap between the macro level, the meso level, and the local or micro level. Um, so, I think one health approach is a good approach to link the macro, meso, and micro level by making work together macroeconomists, mesoeconomists, and micro local social economists like me, for, for example. But the problem is that, more broadly, One Health approach is a complicated approach. <laughs> it's a complicated approach because uh, it is based on the coordination of actors. For example, in the health, just in the health sector in Africa, there is not a lot of coordination between the actors of health. There is not, no reflection about social determinants of health. So, uh, the public health action is based on the Ministry of Health. It is not based on the Ministry of Agriculture, Environment, and so on. It is a, a necessity to cordon, to coordinate actors. So, of course, it is much more demanding than a vertical and compartmentalized approach. I would say uh, the trajectory of uh, weak sustainability is more a vertical and compartmentalized approach, and the uh, the approach of One Health is more a complex approach, so of course it's difficult to implement this approach, but we will try. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. So we begin to have a few questions online, so Ramona and Jean-Francois, I will phrase your questions uh, later on, but we're going to move on to Laura Carvalho uh, and to Latin America as well. So Laura, you will discuss structural challenges for green and inclusive growth in Latin America. Laura, the floor is yours. Your microphone seems to be off. It's on now. Okay. Can, you, can you all hear me well? We can hear you and see you. Okay, can you also see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I will uh, start by telling a little bit the story of um, the recent trajectory of 
economic growth in Latin America and how it was able to combine a reduction of inequality, but uh, with um, a, a type of growth that I think illustrates some of the challenges we face in the region uh, uh, as we think about uh, a plan for decarbon decarbonization and a just transition. Um, basically, uh, what I would do here uh, in this introductory piece of the presentation is to start by telling the story of the recent past. So we had um, in Latin America uh, a wave of uh, governments that tried to combine economic growth and a reduction of inequality through different types of policies. And in a certain, to a certain degree, we're able to do that. Of course, the, the climate agenda was not central to these agendas in the 2000s, but um, still, uh, I think uh, this example helps illustrate some of the current challenges that the new wave of governments is facing in the region. Um, first, uh, what happened in the 2000s is that, of course, the, the region benefited from a commodity price boom. And uh, structurally speaking, um, the, the period of higher growth there had um, a, a big influence uh, from this external scenario that was quite favorable. And, of course, is one of the main difficulties in in following an alternative strategy that does not rely so much on commodities and right on the contrary um, uh, tries to um, move away from the reliance on, on natural resources and uh, a, a green um, um, type of, of economic growth. So the first element, of course, that will be present uh, today is that um, Fiscal constraints have always played a big role, uh, especially in determining public investment in infrastructure uh, in the region. Um, uh, the only reason we were able in the 2000s to expand investment in infrastructure and actually in some cases develop some renewable energy sources um, in some countries, but also infrastructure more generally, um, was because of the boom in, in government revenues that was associated with the commodity price boom itself. And by the time the commodity price boom ended in 2011 first, and then you had a sharp drop in, in oil prices in 2014, the region actually has been cutting public investment. And I think right now it may be the major constraint to any plans for a transition. Uh, so the dependency on commodities is not just a matter of balance of payments, it's also a matter of fiscal policy and how um, uh, pro-cyclical public investments have been. Um, so this L is... Laura, yeah. I'm sorry, we can, we can hear you, but if you can turn up the volume a little bit. Uh, oh. uh, I don't know if it's on your side or not our side, so if you can try and... Because I can see people I don't know out. How to do that. Let me try to. Um, okay, if it's not possible, you, you can you can carry on, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't really have a volume. Okay, no. So if if it's not on your side, <laughs> just carry yeah. on. It's not that bad here. <laughs> Okay, so I'll try to be closer to the microphone. Um, so, fiscal constraints are the first um, challenge. The second one, of course, is external constraints and uh, the dependence on commodities in particular. Um, the, the, the experience of the 2000s has relied heavily on um, the, the commodity price boom itself to keep the trade uh, balance and not deepen any type of uh, external imbalance in these countries. The fact that uh, uh, any process of growth, and in particular green growth, will rely on foreign technology in a region that does not have the economic structure to provide uh, uh, for uh, highly complex goods that are involved in this process, uh, means that any, any and, and this happened in the 2000s, any time we try to grow, 
uh, we rely more and more on imports of uh, technologically sophisticated goods. And the only reason we were able to avoid a balance of payments crisis during this period of higher growth was the, 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 the alleviation, uh, the, 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 the effect, the, the role of the commodity price boom itself in guaranteeing the exports. So this is just something that I'll mention later as we try to come up with a plan for a just transition in the region. Of course, if we don't want to rely on commodities, we need to guarantee the sustainability of uh, the balance of payments in, in a different way, which would require necessarily either some other forms of exports or of import substitution. Um, the, the third element that appeared in the 2000s as a constraint to the, even to the type of growth that we were having then was the skill level of the labor force. So as the economy grew, what happened is that um, in, in the, we, we actually relied, the, the, the larger growth was in the sectors of basically services that benefited mostly from this growth process in the 2000s, especially as um, uh, uh, consumption was boosted domestically and went towards personal services, um, so non-tradable sectors uh, in general. And these sectors employ intensively and employ a lower skilled labor force. And this is a crucial element for why in that process we were able to reduce wage inequalities. Uh, uh, we actually had a big boost in the demand for low-skilled labor during these years, uh, which is not the case in a process that, for instance, um, develop sectors that, um, on the contrary, demand higher skilled labor. We have a big abundance of low-skilled labor in the labor force in Latin America, uh, many of those in the informal sector, uh, and if we do have a process that um, uh, boosts the, the, the type of jobs that require higher quality and, uh, well, higher quality jobs that require higher skilled labor, we will face with a trade-off there, which is we will probably strengthen the bargaining power of those higher skilled labor, uh, workers relative to the abundant lower skilled workers um, that are available, therefore, increasing wage disparities. And this is one of the main uh, dimensions of the trade-offs um, that we'll face in a just transition um, in Latin America. Finally, the, finally uh, a fourth element that we uh, struggled with in the 2000s that is maybe now even more of a concern is the uh, inflationary pressure and especially the external drivers of inflation in the region. So we uh, ended up relying uh, a lot on the overvaluation of the currency, so the exchange rates during that time, especially because of the commodity price boom and the inflow of capital, um, was uh, uh, the way uh, that go the governments were able to anchor inflation uh, in the region, um, especially since when wages are growing and you actually manage to have uh, an inclusive type of growth, this actually ends up leading to more inflationary pressure as, as wage costs go up and, and the region has some inertia in, in, in inflation that uh, shows up. So the fact that we relied on the exchange rate appreciation is also a challenge because uh, if we want to do that, this, this involves really high interest rates, uh, this uh, harms competitiveness and, and makes the problem of the external constraints worse as we end up importing even more and exporting less and, and harming the prospects for uh, developing certain sectors and technologies. Um, finally, of course, uh, social conflict. Uh, if, if there is a, a, a trade-off, as other speakers have said, between uh, environmental and social, costs and objectives, uh, and this sometimes uh, generates social conflict in the global north. This is even more the case in Latin America. Uh, by the time the commodity price boom ended and the win-win type of solutions were not possible anymore, 
the distributive gains that the the that the, low, the bottom of the distribution were getting in Brazil started to create conflicts as well as uh, issues between landowners uh, and wealth holders and the rest of the economy. So, uh, in general, this um, leads to political crises and political constraints uh, that I think will also be the case in any new attempt to um, uh, move away from the type of, um, uh, let's say, neoliberal or, or um, more conventional type of economic model. Uh, then, just moving to the present, um, because the external scenario is um, a lot less favorable for Latin American governments in this moment than they have been in the 2000s, um, governments uh, are having to uh, face those uh, conflicts and actually come up with new approaches. And instead of uh, relying only on social protection policies and, and some infrastructure investment policies that relied on the commodity price boom to be implemented, um, um, the government, the new wave of, of uh, pink tide uh, governments in the region, uh, as we call it, um, is are start is starting in a different way with uh, a new set of policy tools and interventions. Uh, the first uh, is is the the first common denominator, and I'm focusing here on Chile and Colombia, but uh, Brazil uh, is likely to share some of these um, policy. Um, um, agendas. Um, uh, so we, we need to wait, but there are some some um, signs, let's say, that something similar will be done. Uh, uh, the first element that was absent from the 2000s is that all these governments are starting with a plan for green industrial policy. Uh, as many of you may know, both the government in Chile and in Colombia have invited um, um, Mariana Mazzucato to go there, and they are speaking of mission-oriented development strategies uh, centered in the idea of a just transition. Of course, the challenges are different, um, but um, uh, some of these governments benefit from a large endowment of critical minerals that are actually um, uh, essential inputs to low carbon technologies such as lithium and copper, um, nickel, and of course the idea there is to also take advantage of the, the of these sectors and their capacity to generate income uh, to um, engage in a development strategy that is also a technological development type of strategy, uh, but uh, with a final goal of um, achieving a, a climate transition and as and guaranteeing social uh, social protection for for the citizens, uh, the role of development banks is also. Uh, appearing as crucial national development banks in particular. Um, Colombia is, is uh, 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 already uh, uh, using some of these tools. Chile is actually has an idea of creating a development bank just to support in financing this strategy. Uh, both governments also started with a proposal for tax reforms. Uh, there are questions whether this uh, has chances now to be approved in Chile, given their, their uh, uh, difficulties with approving the constitution, even though the tax reform is not directly linked to the constitution. Of course, the political environment is not as easy as, it, as before. Uh, but in Colombia, it seems that we're, we're moving towards approval. And there is also discussion about a common agenda for tax reform for Latin America. Uh, these tax reforms have some common elements. They are progressive, so they um, do have a, a significant impact in inequality by uh, uh, having some element of an increase in personal income tax for the top earners, um, uh, as well as a wealth tax uh, for top wealth holders and some measures to stop uh, tax evasion. 
uh, they also generate revenues, and this is maybe a symptom of this new scenario. Uh, uh, in the in the wave of governments in the 2000s, there wasn't uh, an increase in there was no proposal for a tax reform. This wasn't part of uh, the agenda, and, and this is exactly because we had the the boom in tax revenues coming from the commodity price boom, and this time this offers an opportunity for uh, tackling inequality in a more structural way, since the, the Latin American tax systems is particularly regressive. Um, so the, the 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 reform proposed in Chile would actually um, raise uh, the 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 tax uh, revenues of GDP by 4.2 percent, um, and in Colombia by 1.72 percent of GDP. Um, and finally, they they have a, a, an element of sustainability, um, different ones. Uh, the proposal in Colombia includes a carbon tax. There is talk about including a carbon tax in Chile as well in a second round. Uh, and both of them have a component of taxing uh, the, the commodity sectors. So in Colombia, there is a 10% tax on oil, gold, and coal exports as a piece of the, the reform. Uh, and in Chile, there is a, a proposal to tax large producers of copper uh, as in a, in a way that is proportionate to the copper price. So it's more of a windfall type of tax. Um, so these are agendas that are already set and that I think um, show the, a little bit of the difference and the non-reliance on um, the on commodities as as the 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 main uh, pillar of of the 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 growth uh, that is being sought in the region. Of course, we the we face um, big constraints and the same constraints as before, or uh, 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 an evolving constraint in some cases. Um, uh, for these agendas to be implemented. Um, uh, we, of course, are in a high debt environment. That's in the global south. This is a problem uh, overall. Uh, of course, countries in Africa are facing that distress already. Some of them are already in, in the negotiations with the IMF and private creditors. It's not the case in Latin America, but uh, we did come out of the COVID-19 crisis with much higher levels of debt. Uh, the situation is a bit heterogeneous in the different countries in the region, uh, but of course the higher interest rates amid the global inflation uh, has uh, made this problem worse and is limiting, if politically or economically, the capacity of these governments to actually engage in these agendas. And uh, austerity seems to still be predominant uh, as, a, as a narrative and uh, as a, 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 a political choice for some of these governments. Um, so this, of course, will harm the prospects of uh, achieving uh, the type of uh, just transition that we want to see. Uh, the second uh, no, challenge. Um, so we would just have one or two minutes left, if you can. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're fine. Uh, then inflation is also, of course, uh, a, a challenge again. Um, this is a global challenge, but that has particular. Uh, 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 dimensions in Latin America, given uh, the, the pressure that emerging market currencies are having in this environment. Then finally, we have a, a, a big challenge with a big political challenge. Um, the process in Latin America necessarily involves uh, land use as central to any decarbonization strategies. And uh, we do have a, a, a problem of a political challenge in some of the areas around the Amazon and the role of uh, agribusiness and landowners and other wealth holders as preventing these agendas from succeeding. Um, and finally, uh, it's not just about the landowners and the wealth holders. There is a, a dynamic uh, uh, that happens between deforestation and social exclusion in the entire Amazon region that I think needs to be taken into account as we develop these agendas. We need some alternative sources of income uh, 
in the region if we want deforestation to be sustainable over time. And that's one aspect, of course, of the just transition, but it's particularly relevant for the region. Um, finally, um, uh, we, I think some changes in the multilateral global systems can help address these challenges. Uh, in particular, of course, climate financing instruments that could uh, get uh, lower borrowing costs uh, for these investments um, in, in, a, in a just transition in Latin America. There are elements that actually require uh, uh, changes in the WTO and the trade policy. Of course, if these governments are trying to do green industrial policy, uh, this is now something um, uh, very hard to do uh, in the global south, even though some countries in the global north, in particular the U.S., is clearly engaging in, in some of it. Uh, finally, energy prices and the monetary policy response, I think, is a challenge for the entire world at the moment and depend on a global response. Um, and the efforts to stop deforestation and especially the, the funding to stop deforestation should definitely not be constrained to the police or the enforcement side, should integrate a, an alternative development agenda. Uh, there is a plan for a green recovery of the Amazon region that has been studied. I don't have time to develop here, but with large employment effects uh, in the region that could help sustain a deforestation strategy without generating uh, more social exclusion and therefore political costs. Uh, for this. So I'll leave it here. And Thank you so much, Laura. We, we'll come back with a few questions, but and you get your applause here in the, in the room. <laughs> um, and thanks for, for making the case that locks in that we tend to think in technological terms or investment terms, like you invest in a coal plant and you are stuck with it for 40 years, can also find equivalents in uh, macroeconomics. As you are mentioning, if your balance of payment is highly dependent on commodity prices, then you are locked in, <laughs> macroeconomically speaking, otherwise your currency is going to drop and you will have uh, strong social consequences. That was one kind of lock-in that you could imagine, and the other one being social, there are a number of jobs, and you are ne not necessarily able to move out of uh, certain sectors due to uh, the, uh, the the number of jobs uh, at stake. Uh, you, al you also mentioned tax issues, so the, uh, I, I may ask the first question and also rebounding on Ramona Angelescu's question online. My question will be both to Mark and, and uh, Laura. Um, you mentioned tax reforms in two different ways. Mark, you, you, you advocated for uh, carbon tax, but with some sort of earmarking, and I wanted to, to, to ask you, do you recommend that because it's good economic policy or because it's good politics or a little bit of both? Uh, you may have read the paper by De Chez Le Prêtre, Stancheva and others. Uh, I, I strongly recommend it. It's a paper that studies public opinion and their opposition to transition, not only in OECD countries, but in a number of emerging uh, countries, including China, including Brazil, uh, and um, I think 18 of the, mo the 21 uh, biggest uh, emitters. And one of the conclusions of the paper is that by earmarking carbon tax, usually you get better politics. But I think you advocated rather in terms of policy, but I wanted to you to to elaborate on that and maybe Laura you you mentioned two examples of, of tax reforms and I wanted to ask what is the political viability or answers or maybe uh, measures for social accompanying uh, accompanying of uh, of this uh, tax reform that you named uh, respectively in uh, Colombia and uh, and Chile so maybe Mark you, you get to answer first and, and then I, I will move to to Laura Yes, yeah, so uh, our exercise was not um, was not uh, about uh, political economy or, or policy. Uh, I mean, the, the political games, uh, but it was really about the evaluation of the impact on society in terms of a social evaluation with some degree of priority for the worse off in the evaluation. So the the fact that we had this uh, social co-benefit of uh, carbon mitigation was really due to the fact that our evaluation had this uh, uh, coefficient of uh, priority for the worse off in the in the computation. Um, so it was just that, and there was no claim that this was the optimal policy, the best one. Uh, it was just, this is a salient policy in the, in the public debate, and, and we could show that at least it would uh, limit the burden on society of a transition for at least uh, four decades or something like that, or three decades, and that may be quite important for, the, for really starting initiating the transition. Um, uh, but 
of course, uh, hopefully uh, this would help with the political uh, constraints, uh, but it's not clear because you may, even if you have something that looks good uh, when you do an evaluation at the social level, um, you still have some groups that, that will lose, right? And so these uh, groups may be uh, very powerful um, or they may be very vocal. Uh, for instance, the rural people who depend on their car, uh, the Yellow Vest Movement was an example of people who are not particularly powerful in the political game, but happen to be very vocal um, and therefore quite influential. Uh, so we, that was not really uh, what we tried to, uh, to analyze in detail. Thank you so much, Mark. And it's true that you can think of the feasibility of a trajectory in terms of purely democratic expression. So do you have a majority for a transition? But also in terms of a level of force opposed to a transition, which is not necessarily exactly the same. Uh, Laura, maybe you, you can explain the, the tax reform process in Colombia and Chile and maybe other countries if you want. Sure. I think uh, this process is in very different stages. Um, in Chile, of course, uh, the, the tax reform didn't come alone. It came with uh, a constitutional process that was trying to address some of the, the other sources of inequality, in particular, expand access to public services and social protection. So that would most likely neutralize uh, any potential regressive uh, effect of the, the carbon tax in particular. And, and of course, the tax reform itself had other progressive components that made its overall effect on the Gini index uh, be negative. Um, um, but in Colombia, uh, things are moving fast and, and they're getting close to approval. Um, and the, the, the type of social transfers that are coming together with it, I think, is also are also able to neutralize. We did a study for Brazil um, that actually simulated the, the effect of a carbon tax in Brazil in the way it was proposed for other countries. And um, indeed in Brazil, we do have a, a, around 0.2% increase in the Gini index um, from a, 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 tax, a carbon tax if done alone, but the revenues generated by it are more than sufficient for uh, an expansion of this, the Brazilian cash transfer program uh, that would uh, fully neutralize the, the Gini, the impacts on the Gini by providing uh, transfers to 30, uh, around 34% of the bottom of the distribution of the poorest in, in the population. So I think this combination uh, would work out um, in the region for sure. Thank you so much, Laura. Maybe I will turn to the room now and ask if there are questions. You can raise your hands. Yes, okay. Question over there. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Magellan. I'm working in conflict prevention in the Middle East and Central Africa. And I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, or the economists in the room, uh, you didn't speak a lot about conflict and conflict prevention. I've been sent to this country, hearing I would see religious conflict, ethnic conflict, what I saw as economy. Either it was population of the place A, lacking resources, moving to another place, and there they were in conflict with population B, or they feared they had less advantages than the other, and they were jealous and just came looting the places. And also there were many young people having a lot of personal energy, but no job and no family, and really likely to, to fear the, the fight. And whenever whoever was happy with the conflict was basically making money for it. So, so I completely understand the difficulty of motivating people to, to make this green shift. But if they don't do it, I mean, then uh, there can be a, be a big lack of resources and then conflict which is basically damaging the poorest people because they cannot flee it. So I understand the dilemma you had, but um, well, to me, it's already happening right now. It's important to have both, that I don't know how to integrate it into a beautiful model. So I'm happy to hear you speaking about that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So you, each of you actually may, may try to answer, but um, 
Uh, and Laura, you mentioned very quickly, but you know, we did not have really have the time to to talk at length about it. But uh, maybe you want to talk about conflict. Bruno, you talked about the potential incompatibility between uh, environmental and social objectivity. Did you, in your experience or work, witness uh, conflicts, <laughs> not in principle, but in uh, practical terms? I have the most difficult question. Thank you, Mag Maglon. Thank you very much. <laughs> Actually, I think economists are not competent to talk about conflicts. But, but I know that in some uh, economical works, they try to integrate the conflict in the, I wouldn't say models, I they try to integrate the conflicts in the way uh, um, trajectoire de vie, livelihood trajectories uh, evolve, you know? For example, in uh, uh, Central Africa, uh, the country uh, where you work, in Cameroon, in the North Cameroon, uh, they know that there are a lot of problems. For example, in the North Cameroon, where, when people receive the aid of uh, the public sector, uh, they use it anticipating the future conflicts with Boko Haram coming from Chad and so on. So we can uh, integrate the conflicts in our models, but the level of uncertainty is so high that it's very, very difficult. That's the reason why, in I think, uh, in development economic, uh, economics, uh, we have created, it's not me, <laughs> we have created, <laughs> some people have created, the category of, you know, uh, uh, relèvement, uh, relevance, the category of uh, resilience to conflict and so on. But it is a first step. After the resilience, they have to build a new model of development. So. I think that is the reason why um, uh, located economy is so important, actually, because if they are able to develop circular economy and located economy, I would say it's easier, for example, for peasants to uh, rebuild the economy because they are coming back to the basic of economy. So for me, it's easier to relocate economy before the conflicts or in front of the conflicts. Maybe I will turn to Laura first because I will uh, expand the question for Mark later on. But Laura, you mentioned in your presentation social conflicts. You named a few examples like uh, important landowners, for example, being able to oppose uh, certain change, not because of their numbers or immediate uh, democratic power, but because of other leverage. Uh, can you maybe expand on that or illustrate a kind of conflict or opposition to, to green transition? Thank you. Yes, I think this is core to the political economy of these um, agendas. And uh, indeed, it's not just a matter of landowners, right? And versus, let's say, indigenous populations. This this happens and, and, and we see in the region, it's one of the regions with the highest uh, levels of, of risk to uh, environmental defenders, for instance, and, and those that are trying to uh, hold to, to these territories. But uh, on top of that, I think there is a, a piece which is landowners do, uh, did win the political discourse in some of the urban centers around the Amazon region, given that uh, the sources of income in those regions that are much poorer than the average uh, Brazilian city, right? So the urban population that is the majority of the population, it's almost 80% of the population around the Amazon, uh, does rely on many sources, on, on a few sources of income, and so many of them are associated with the type of um, a business uh, that uh, uh, is at the core of the, 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 the dynamics of deforestation. And this means that the political support for a, an agenda that move away from this model even by poor people in the urban centers in the region is not uh, now um, uh, making uh, anything better. It's actually an additional source of conflict. So you have conflict even between indigenous people and urban poor populations in this area, which I think uh, is one of the challenges. And that's why we need in the approach to incorporate alternative uh, economic sources of income and uh, reduction of inequality and infrastructure that actually uh, benefits uh, this area to sort of alleviate uh, this conflict. Thank you, Laura, for mentioning the very important issue of 
compensation, which can be sh social, of course. Uh, Mark, I will maybe uh, um, reinterpret the question on conflict, but you, you earlier you mentioned burden sharing, uh, which is uh, very important at the national level, but also at the international level. Um, earlier on in a previous session, someone said, we, we know we have a, a target, so now let's apply uh, that, that target. But uh, of course, the Paris Agreement set a target, uh, and there were NDCs associated with these targets, but I'm not sure NDCs can be fully uh, considered as national targets, and certain, um, certainly not over the long term. So, so there still remains a need to, to, to define uh, national targets uh, of emissions, but uh, related to national targets, of course, you get uh, financing issues or technology transfer issues. Uh, Laura also mentioned uh, partly at the end of our, of our presentation. So you, you made a, a sort of a simulation of a potential burden sharing at the international level. Uh, however, uh, if you look at the figures in your presentation, they're very important. If you look at the second or third column in the slide that you, that you showed, uh, we, we saw that climate finance is not at all in the range of uh, ODA, for example, official development assistance, but in a much bigger range. So um, I would <laughs> ask you basically how you see that this question of burden sharing on emissions on the one on the one hand and on on financial terms on uh, on the other hand because it's uh, uh, the simulation is uh, both convincing but uh, to some extent uh, <laughs> challenging considering the numbers. Yeah, so I, I don't think I have a I have an easy answer to this question, and I would like to link it to the question of uh, of um, conflicts actually because indeed it's a, it's a very touchy issue. Uh, so you're right, the the Paris Agreement is uh, is really on shaky grounds because the NDCs are not achieving the goals, and the SECs will the pledges will not be. Uh, implemented, uh, most likely, right? So there is this double gap uh, and this double failure of implementation. So, so this is a very serious, uh, serious concern. And indeed, because of of the reasons you were mentioning, there are a lot of conflicts internal and external. Um, I mean, uh, international and, and and national about how to distribute the burden. So I don't have a, a silver bullet to propose, but I would really like to uh, to connect back to this question of uh, conflicts because there is, of course, one dimension of conflicts which is somehow easy to incorporate in our analysis, which is this um, empirical. Uh, forecast of uh, of mortality, for instance, linked to conflicts, and there are studies now looking at uh, the the link between temperature and uh, and mortality uh, due to uh, due to violence. Right, so this is easy, but but the questions, the quarrels about uh, burden sharing and all these other things, uh, uh, resource management, water stress, and all these sorts, these things, uh, can destabilize uh, political governance, both uh, nationally and internationally, um, and and this issue is uh, is where we have a lot of uncertainty, as, as one mentioned before. And this uncertainty is, is essentially impossible, really, to fathom and to put into our, our analysis, because um, I, I usually say uh, in this kind of conversation that we talk a lot about tipping points in the geophysical system, but the most dangerous and the most um, likely uh, um, uh, lethal tipping points that will occur are in the human system. Uh, that we will we will kill ourselves, if I may say, before the Earth will kill us, and um, and so that's um, that's the key issue we are facing. Thank you, Mark. We'll take maybe other questions. I, I, I see. I think Eric, and then then on your side. Okay, we have th three questions and three minutes, so I will ask you to be very <laughs> uh, quick. <laughs> okay. Please, Eric. Thank you. Uh, I heard Bruno offer a hypothesis that one reason why there's a seeming conflict between social, meeting social and environmental goals is because when you try to address social goals in an unsustainable economy, you deepen the need for the, for the unsustainable economy in the, the next round. I just wondered if that resonated with you, Mark and Laura. Do you confirm, <laughs> do you support that hypothesis? Sorry for my English. Uh, Est-ce que je peux parler français? Est-ce que vous avez observé une corrélation entre Have you observed a link between the literacy policy of a country and the possibility to increase resilience to climate change in that country? Okay. Um, je vais peut-être prendre la dernière question. 
ce qui m'a frappé donc dans les titres que je citais tout à l'heure de Déchir le prêtre, Stan Chabra et Saint-Denis Bordeaux, really c'est plusieurs choses. Euh, D'abord, le niveau de connaissance et de compréhension du changement climatique qui est très élevé dans le monde, y compris dans les pays émergents. La deuxième chose, c'est que la possibilité de la volonté de créer des changements n'est pas toujours liée à l'économie émergente. Il y a parfois des gens qui ont besoin de changer et de transitionner dans les pays émergents. Et la troisième qui ferme la solution, developing in emerging countries and developed countries. And then, very often, people say that they would be willing to change, but only if three conditions are met. First, the policy has to be efficient, and secondly, it has to be fair, and third, the impact on the individual has to be as moderate as possible. So I think it sums up very quickly and very honestly uh, the type of obstacles that exist to change. Any other question? Laura, did you want to answer Eric's questions on... Sure, yeah, I think it does make sense to me, of course. Uh, I'm not sure how generalizing, how, how we can generalize it and and we, we should investigate more, but we, we do have a bit of a chicken and egg problem uh, when it comes to sustainability and the social um costs of of getting to a different trajectory i think in the example i was using in the uh, with the dynamics of social exclusion and deforestation this is very clear uh we we depend on the type of um uh, activities that lead to more deforestation because of uh, the lack of a, a different trajectory, and that generates the type of social costs of moving away from it. But of course, there is a third way, uh, which is to, to have a, an alternative economic agenda for the region. And I think we're very often trapped in, in the, the type of dynamics that the current uh, economic model generates. Thank you so much, Laura. Mark, maybe just the last word before before we conclude? Yeah, very quickly, yes. So we have all these uh, dilemmas which are both uh, um, um, uh, instantaneous and over time. Uh, but but, uh, but there, are, there are synergies and we should try to multiply the synergies. And I, just to give you an example, I did not mention health co-benefits of environmental policy. So this is a big deal in some countries, especially in emerging economies where you have a lot of pollutions with industrial activities and urbanization. So, so we should make the most of these synergies. Thank you so much, Mark, for finishing on a more positive note and also explaining that uh, on top of uh, uh, conflicts or tension between environmental and uh, economic or social objectives, there might be other co-benefits uh, to be thought after and which may actually change the equation, uh, in particular if you talk about emerging countries, certainly air pollution in cities is a major factor for evolution. So again, many thanks for, for joining and participating in this panel. For all the participants uh, here in Paris, we have a cocktail immediately nearby so you may you may join the party if I may say uh, and uh, and thanks again Laura for for joining us uh, uh, from Brazil so bye bye thank you everyone merci beaucoup à toutes et à tous bonne fin de journée Welcome back, everyone, um, to these concluding sessions. Uh, I can see that the previous session has spurred some very interesting debates that have difficulties to stop now. But unfortunately, I, uh, I have to be uh, here to remind you that, that we have our last concluding session, not to telling what was announced here. Um, and today, so, so before I, I try to, well, we try to conclude uh, these very two very interesting days, um, we have the privilege of having uh, one last inter intervention. Um, Mathis Wackernagel, uh, uh, co-founder and president of Global Footprint Network USA, is going to uh, uh, have a one last session. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, Mathis, we're very uh, glad to have you here today. Uh, let me just you introduce you to the, to the crowd for those that actually don't know you yet. Um, so uh, Mathis Wackernagel created the Footprint concept in the early 1990s um, with Bill Rees to compare human demand against planetary or regional ecosystem regeneration. Uh, the carbon footprint proportion, portion sorry, has become the most popular variant. In 2003, he founded the Global Footprint Network, a sustainability think tank, making planetary constraints relevant to decision making. Its largest engagement campaign in its, is its annual Earth Overshoot Day. 
Mathis honors include the, two, the two, 2018 World Sustainability Award, the 2015 IEA Global Environment Award, and the 2012 Blue Planet Prize. Uh, as you can see, uh, what he will uh, present today is clearly in the theme of the conference, and we're very, very happy to have you here, Mathis. Um, I will give you the floor for 20 minutes, and then we'll have a bit of uh, questions, and we'll try to conclude this uh, conference. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, particularly, I'm glad I'm speaking to the French AfD and not to the German AfD that is getting arrested uh, these days. So it's, much, it's a much better audience. So thank you so much and uh, to, to invite me to an incredibly important theme. Let me see if I can share the screen here. <clears throat> so what I would like to talk about is how, um, why resource security is important for poverty eradication and also for economic stability. Let me just start this way. Uh, we are living in a totally new world. Back in the days, we were small. We humans were small compared to the biosphere. Now we're in a situation where we're extremely large. Uh, some people call it the Anthropocene. We would say the main driver, what's distinct, is that we are now using more than what Earth can renew. It's called overshoot in English, uh, le dépassement in, in, in French. And that's shifting the dynamics on the planets. I mean, I say it's shifting the dynamics on the planet. It's it's not just kind of the economic rules that are set. It's just the, the way that the system operates. Now, what's the evidence that we are an overshoot? I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the, the planetary boundaries, for example. There's a lot of evidence that biodiversity is going down. We have too much CO2 in the atmosphere, not the greenhouse gas, et cetera. But how do we make it operational? How do all these things link together? We take a particular lens because our view is that the most limiting factor which all life depends on is regeneration. What do I mean by regeneration? The ability of nature to renew itself, to, to green itself through photosynthesis, producing biomass, and the various aspects as they are also looked at through planetary boundaries enable this regeneration. They're like production factors production factors that make it possible, and if they're not there, reduce the ability of ecosystems to regenerate. Why is it the essential limiting factor, material limiting factor? Obviously it's for food and fiber, the limiting factor, but also when we look at fossil fuels, there's lots of fossil fuels on the ground, but even more limiting than what's on the ground is how much the earth can absorb from the waste that is being produced as we use it. In other words, um, fossil fuel use also competes with biological demands like producing food. Same is true for minerals and ores. There's plenty of them in the planet itself, but obviously to get them, we need more energy, we destroy ecosystems, etc. So also getting to all the minerals we want to use is in competition with bio. Uh, with regeneration so that's kind of the essence how we look at the word lives competition for regeneration humans compete against each other but we also compete with other animals the fish i eat for example is not available to the seal now how can we track that regeneration there are a number of ways we could use kilograms but not every kilogram is the same that, that we use we could use carbon we could go watts but again watts are complicated because there's a cascade of energy like how much energy comes from the sun and how little that is to put into um, the energy content of biomass for example we can put it in dollars but that looks at social preferences not at ecological functioning uh, we can look at surface areas but then not all surface areas are equally productive that's why we go for global hectares that, that means hectares of ecological productivity that are scaled for the productivity that they embody. So just to, um, so, so, so basically a global hectare would be an average hectare that is biologically productive, scaled by its relative productivity according to potential net primary productivity. Now, this allows us then to compare how much nature we have and how much nature we use. So we call that income side biocapacity, the expenditure would be the ecological footprint. So that's looking at the two sides, income, expenditure in ecological flow terms. How much do we have? About 24% of the planet's surface 
is ecologically highly productive, where you can harvest this regeneration. And if you do that on a per capita basis, what you get, we're now about 8 billion people, that leads to about 1.5 hectares of ecologically productive space that we have available. This is based on UN statistics. Uh, it's now done by York University. We use about 15,000 data points per country and year. And then we can also look at the other side. How much does it take to maintain the metabolism, the physical metabolism on which we, um, on which we live? Currently worldwide, we use about 2.7 global hectares of ecological productive space, more than there is. How is it possible to use more it's like with money? You can have a higher flow of demand that is being regenerated, the difference comes from dipping into the stocks. So if you look at the global total, we see that, that Earth, that we're using at least 75% faster the regenerative resources on the planet than they're being renewed. Um, I say at least because it's all based on UN data. UN data is very production oriented, so bio regeneration is probably exaggerated because a lot of damage is not captured. It's also not capturing all the demands. So this is a, probably a, a, an underestimate, a very likely underestimate. We can translate that ratio into time. We can say how much, like by, by when in the year will we have used the entire budget from January 1st to that date. Last year or this year in 2022, it fell on July 28th. Uh, it's called Earth Overshoot Day in French, Le Jour uh, du Dépassement de la Terre. Um, that's when, um, when theoretically we have like used up the budget for the other 156 days of the year. We live off depletion, statistically speaking. Now we can also apply that to various countries, uh, as we do, because the, the, actually the global total is the sum of all the countries, and we can look at the countries as if they were farms, because actually they are farms. And we compare here in color, how much do they use for their consumption? You can also look at it from production, but here, how much do they use for their consumption compared to what their ecosystems can renew? And what we find is the following, which is particularly relevant for this conference. There are 72% of the world population now live in countries that have a double condition that is quite challenging. One is, they use more than what they have available. So they are in red here. They use more than what they have available. And that's not possible forever. We cannot forever overuse ecological resources. Um, <clears throat> on average, of course, through trade, we can use more in one place than another place. But again, 72% live in countries that, one, use more than what they have. And second, they have less than world average income. That means they cannot compensate their resource deficit through accessing international markets. International markets will be able to get more from them than they are able to get from those international markets. 72%, so here's the map again, the same, same idea, which countries have this double challenge, earning less than world average income and having less available within their country than what they use. So that makes them resource insecure. So it's a very large majority and it's a growing majority in the world. Given this context, the question then becomes, what strategies are needed to generate success for each country, for example, or each city, or each company? That would like to take a little bit of sidestep first to say um, the following, to say, in essence, what we want to find out is what will be valuable in this predictable future? What I mean by predictable future is there uh, like there's more overshoot now. That means for sure there will be more climate change and there will be more resource constraints. So we know more about the future than ever, that people will want to eat and sleep and everything, and that we will have more climate change and resource constraints. And the question then becomes, what aspects will become more valuable? And that's a very different question from saying, what does the market now recognize with GDP contribution? Because even though we are massive overshoot, in massive overshoot, the significance of regeneration is not seen by the market. And so we overuse it without feedback, that, which means we're moving into disruption states because the market is not adjusting to this reality. Why do we know that? For example, this is a very simple graph that we published some years back. When you look at 
the world, like low-income countries with very high share of agriculture. Uh, in those countries under $2,000, typically at least 60% of the population works in agriculture, 60% of GDP is in agriculture, some, at least like that. You would expect, or I would expect as a, as a Swiss, you know, we're looking at our farms, the bigger the farm, the more it can generate income. I would expect something like the red curve. But what you really see is this, that there is no real correlation or a slight negative correlation still between availability of regeneration, biocapacity as we call it per person in the country and income. So this is just to say today, the market does not see the value of regenerative capacity. So again, that's kind of, it's, 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 it's different what's valuable right now. So the question again is, what will be valuable in the predictable future? And our answer is the following. If we accept that we are moving into a world of resource constraints and climate change, we believe particularly those projects or companies or cities and countries, as you expand your activities, global overshoot goes down. These are the most valuable aspects. Why? Because it will not you will not run into constraints, into these physical constraints, and you will be needed more. Let me just give you a simple example, a car factory. A car factory, obviously, a car factory as it expands, produces more cars, and cars as they're being used, use more resources. So overshoot goes up as you have more of the car factory. Windmill factory also requires resources to produce the windmills, but then as the windmills displace coal power, overshoot goes down. So in this, this case, it's a company when it goes up in, in economic activity, global overshoot goes down. Just to give you an example, worldwide, on average, to produce one euro or one dollar, which is not the same value add in the world, it takes about two and a half square meters of space. So each two and a half square meters of ecological productive space, average space, are able to produce on average every year one dollar. That's the world average. Very different per country because high income countries have higher labor costs. So there's, that, that means the res there's less resource per dollar, uh, but that's kind of the average. We just work with the company, it's a recycling company in Germany. When they expand, or for every dollar that they produce in value add to GDP, they reduce global overshoot 28 square meters. How do they do it? It's a, uh, they, they live off recycling, they, they recuperate waste streams, bring them back into, into the economy. So they are reducing overshoot. So these kind of companies will be needed more. And the more they exist, the more overshoot goes down. So all these unique, we have this website, called Power of Possibility, where we have over 100 examples of categories where we say, if we did this worldwide, how many days would Earth Overshoot Day be moved? So these are things that are economically viable and at the same time are able to reduce overshoot. They come in five categories. So we try to make it simple because our hand has five fingers. So it's essentially the five large factors that drive, that drive overshoot. And the question is, do we find in each one of them activities that are economically viable and then also drive overshoot down? So in the demand side and the supply side, uh, the question is how healthy is the planet? So this is the thumb. <clears throat> uh, we have regenerative agriculture, carbon sequestration, for example, all these kind of things that strengthen the regeneration of the planet. On a demand side, the question is, how do we build our cities? Are they efficiently built and constructed and managed? Uh, that's kind of the efficiency of houses, but also transportation pathways. Uh, it very much shapes like the way cities are constructed, very much shapes consumption patterns overall. Then how are the cities powered? Are, we, are they powered by coal power? Are they powered by solar power? It makes a big difference. How do we feed ourselves? About 55% of the biocapacity today, of the globe's biocapacity, 55% of it, already today is used to feed ourselves. And then obviously how many we are, if we double as many, there is only half as much capacity around. And the question is like, they're actually, that's a slow moving one, but very incrementally um, cumulative with also a lot of potential social benefits, investing more in women, in health, um, educational outcomes are better, et cetera. So there's a lot of benefits in that uh, last finger as well, social benefits that we can generate 
uh, quickly. So that's just more kind of an orientation scheme. Where are the opportunities to find places where we can generate value? So we would say a circle of business really in the end is one. When you expand it, global overshoot goes down. Or a project, if you expand that project, global overshoot goes down. So that's the essence that I would like to bring to the conversation here, that the future has never been more predictable. We've always known that we wanna eat and sleep and have a good time and move around. That's a given. And at the same time, in whatever imaginable scenario, there will be more climate change. With more climate change, there will be more depleted ecological resources. And if you want to not have too much climate change, we need to move out of fossil fuels very, very soon, which also puts constraints on ourselves. The future is inevitably regenerative. The question is only how quickly we get there. And particularly those who don't have the resources at hand themselves and don't have the financial means to buy them from the others. And there will always be people that have less than average income. If this condition is not addressed, if resource security doesn't become core to our development strategies, it's very hard to imagine how poverty can be eradicated and how prosperity can be maintained. That's the introduction, simple introduction. Uh, that's the essence, and I'm very much looking forward to potential questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Matisse. Uh, I, I have a question, but uh, I, I don't know if other, uh, I mean, maybe um, uh, you can go ahead uh, uh, and start gathering your thoughts. Uh, while I do this, I, 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 when people do this, I, I can start with my question. So, so thank you, uh, Matisse. It's uh, extremely interesting, and, and uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, biophysical unit that we can use to try to uh, uh, discuss about um, um, possible futures. Um, my, my question would be, um, how does the inclusion of social aspects, such as the reduction of multidimensional inequalities or um, uh, lengthening of, of uh, life or, 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 or things like that can be incorporated into the, into the, into the overshoot? Because my, my gut feeling here, but maybe I, uh, I misunderstood, it, it, it relies mostly on, on biophysical aspects, but not so much on, on, on quality of life. And so in the end, uh, would um, would I mean? Would you have the same footprint if you had two different unequal uh, one, say, one very unequal society and one very equal society? Or or is there any way in which you could incorporate these social aspects in your in your um, framework? I believe metrics are most useful if they have a clear research question and we know what we are actually measuring. So measuring our demand compared to how much is being regenerated and from there being able to deduce overshoot is helpful because it shows us the, the physical condition. Now, is that is this an ecological measure? I would say it's much more a social measure because if resource security is not there, the social impacts are dramatic. Um, it's also more of an economic measure because it, so economics cannot, economies cannot operate without the resources. If society is not um, fed, then, then it has huge social consequences. So overshoot is kind of the, the big theme of the 21st century that we need to address. We have, since I think 2005, actually out of a French PhD, it came from, um, from Dr. Arnaud. Um, he, um, he, we, we looked at this simple graph to say, sustainable development is really about two things. That's why there are two words. We want to have great lives, that's one axis. And the other axis, we only have one planet. So we can make a dot for every person or every country or every city to, to basically on that graph, look at where is the country right now in terms of well-being, and how many Earth would it take if everybody lived at that level? And so then you can make a square to say, where would we need to be to have high quality of life and on the other hand, uh, we live within the budget of the planet. At this point, no country is in this square. Uh, it's, if, if you look at kind of the graph, and I can send you the link later on, or you can go to our website. Actually, if you look for sustainable development, you will see the graph very clear. It's very related to perhaps you have heard of the, the donut, econ uh, donut economics. It's just donut economics with numbers. Um, you can look at how the countries um, are moving away from the box 
um, unfortunately. So it, that can be measured. Now, how do we measure the other side? Like I, I talked about resource constraints, how do we measure bad well-being? There are various ways how to measure well-being. Um, I would think a very good measure, very observable measure is longevity. So you could look at like longevity as a, as a first indication. If a society is inequitable, longevity on average plummets. If they are unhappy, longevity plummets. If they're poor institutions or it's not good educational system, uh, uh, longevity is, is much, much lower. So, so longevity could be one measure. There's also the Human Development Index by the UN. It's an aggregate could be used so, we, so you can correlate that and look at those those areas. And, and then in the end, each project that you do, the question is to what extent is it moving the dots where you are right now in a direction where we need to be to have a robust economy. One that where people have great outcomes socially and they can operate within the resource constraints of our planet, not living off depletion. Thank you, uh, Mathis. Um, is there any question in the room? Yes. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start by saying I, I fully agree with you. The, the graph that you've just been describing, uh, Antoine and I have been looking at it and talking about how to get into that box, but I'm going to play devil's advocate. So Please do. <laughs> suppose I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur and I, mm -hmm. I look towards the predictable future and I put together a, 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 a business that is going to uh, meet that goal for the for that longer run, predictable future, I put together my business plan and I go to the bank and they say, well, there isn't, uh, you, you, you don't have a, a market yet. So no, you won't be able to pay this loan back. So no. So I guess how, how can we translate these, this longer term imperative into near term financial decision making on the part of, of yes. yeah. You get it. That's an awesome. That's an awesome question, and, and I wouldn't even connect it with the devil. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, so, so, as we engage with a lot of companies, and there's a French company I'm going to mention uh, in just a second. That's exactly the driving question to say, given our context of climate change and resource constraints, which will ever more determine our context, what is going to be valuable? And we say it's companies. If they're already now financially viable, those who are also at the same time able to reduce global overshoot, imagine the advantage they will have in the future. So from an investment perspective, I would invest primarily in companies that are able to do that because on a trajectory, like if you invest, you want to know what's going to become more valuable, not what is valuable now, but what's going to become more valuable or maintain its value. One example of a large company is Schneider Electric in France led by a CEO who has worked for 36 years, I believe, in that company, who recognized that what the company offers, the purpose of the company, which is decarbonization and digitization, is exactly what society or the world needs. We need to electrify and reduce our carbon uh, impact. So that company, the CEO wants to know how much CO2 are we saving as a company in the world compared to how much CO2 does it take for us as a company to operate? And so that's kind of the driver because in the end, companies are machines. And the question is also, is the machine able to deliver? If it's able to deliver, the financials also are much more likely to look positive. So for Schneider Electric, it has become very liberating because they can say more Schneider, better planet. I think that's actually true. Um, and, and so that's actually true for any projects. If you have this ability to say, we in, invest in these kind of things, the likelihood of these investments that reduce overshoot and are already now financially viable, that, that they will be the winners in the future is very high. And that's also of great social benefit because wealth generation is not just good for the investor, it's good for society as a whole because it maintains our ability as humans to produce the flows on which we depend. So there's no contradiction from my perspective. Thank you, Matisse. Okay, hello, thanks Thanks a lot. Can you elaborate a little bit on your little finger? I mean, the demography issue, yes, this one. Um, as, um, I mean, 
there are lots of contradictions as well here uh, in, in people's mind. Typically, uh, more people is more problem. On other, on other directions, some people say that we can feed 2 billion people without problem if we just change our diets. On uh, another perspective, um, there is the notion of um, uh, what you mentioned, education and, uh, and uh, better social uh, uh, issues, better lives will anyway uh, reduce uh, the number of people probably. And finally, some people, some youngsters, uh, maybe in the room, decide not to uh, have t uh, kids on behalf of ecology because they are they believe that we are already too many. So I think we have lots of issues related to your little fingers. If you can uh, just elaborate a little bit on that, it would be very helpful. Thanks. Thank you so much. That could probably be a whole conference on its on its own. It's a very delicate issue because often we just look backwards and then the question is who is responsible and is it finger pointing? Who do we need to finger point to? If you look into the future, the question becomes much more simple. Is the world going to be better off in 2100? With 11 billion people or with six billion people, and 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 it's and it's all about kind of, and that's one point. And the other point is also most transition, the, the effective demographic transitions are not coercive. If you look at Portugal, for example, Portugal has now a reproductive rate of 1.4 uh, children per woman, um, which is very low, and there's no population policy in place in Portugal that kind of reduced family size. It's all because of women have more opportunities, they can participate, et cetera. So, so, so the, the non-coercive means, uh, the non-coercive ways are far, far more effective and, and, and much more uh, acceptable, obviously. So I'm just gonna say it's possible to have quite different outcomes in the future. So which one is preferable? Now, just currently already, if you look at overshoot, we use about 1.75 Earth, Currently, um, ecologists say to maintain 85% of biodiversity, we shouldn't use more than half a planet. So half a planet compared to 1.75. So currently, the resource throughput we live on is about threefold too big, meaning we live off depletion to a large extent. We live in a Ponzi scheme, we live in a pyramid scheme, we are using up the future to pay for the present. So yes, currently, we are able to produce food that produces enough calories for everybody, currently. Uh, is it possible to do that in the long run? That's a, it's a big debate. I would say to a large extent, if you also want to move out of fossil fuel use, um, which is a large driver to increase or to make much more simple food production, um, it, it's going to be much, much more challenging to produce these big amounts of food. We have on our website a little, just kind of, it's a bit of tongue in cheek argumentation. We call it the 10 impossible imperatives of food production. 10 things that seem quite impossible that need to happen to maintain a very high level of food production. There is a lot of waste, obviously, in the food system we can cut out. There's no question. Um, but, but if you compare average calorie consumption in, for example, Belgium compared to Pakistan or India, it's probably about 50% more calories are, are used in, in Belgium than in, in, in Pakistan and India. Um, also, that's also a reflection of food waste, et cetera. But then even more extreme, is the calorie footprint intensity or the footprint intensity per calorie. In, 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 in India, they eat every quart of grain, even uh, or like broken rice, et cetera. In, in Belgium, they eat just very elegant food. So the calorie intensity, or fo the footprint intensity per calorie is about five to six fold different in, in Pakistan and India compared to Belgium. So, so yes, there's something squeezable, but then it also it's about the quality of food, et cetera. So yeah, there's squeezability, but the question is what is in the interest of future generations? Should, would, would they be better off encouraging large families or would they be better off encouraging small families? Perhaps the last thing I wanna say, there's a lot of misconception that a slowly shrinking population is, is, is increasing dependency ratio. And it's actually exactly the opposite in a very highly industrialized society. Shrinking populations have much better dependency ratios because it takes more and more effort to also get young people ready for their jobs. And old people are healthier in some ways. So in terms of dependency ratios, how many people need to look after other people is becoming more favorable in a shrinking population. So also economically, it's a different society than what we have right now, but economically, it's absolutely feasible to have shrinking populations, probably economically more beneficial even in the short run. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I have a question concerning energy. 
Um, as you said, uh, energy is a key point. Uh, and producing energy now in the transition is using more renewable energy. But to produce this energy, it needs a lot of raw materials. And we need to extract them because recycling is not sufficient to face the needs and will not be in the coming decades. So if we are optimistic, on one hand, we could say that this is a good opportunity to create jobs. But on the other hand, it has a strong environmental impact. Many mines are located in the south. And so it's also, it can have a really negative impact for a uh, social impact too, because of conflicts around land uses, around the use of energy and water. So what do you think of this? I mean, there's no free lunch ever. Uh, at the same time, I mean, do we want to use the mine to produce more cars or do we want to produce, uh, use more mines to produce more windmills in some ways? I think at the end, it's a very pragmatic question that we, as we, like we are economically active and we need to think about our budgets and, and our expenditures, our investments particularly, are they producing a more valuable future or not? I mean, it's, 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 it's true for a city. If a city continues to invest money, as in my hometown, they have recently to build more parking garages, even though they say that we're in a, in a, in a, <laughs> we're in a, in a climate emergency, these parking garages, I think, will be much less valuable than to invest in a uh, bicycle path, for example, the Dutch have done cost-benefit analysis on, on bicycle transportation, recognizing that that uh, bicycle kilometers per, per person kilometers per bi for bicycles are about 10 times cheaper than public transportation and have massively invested in their um, bicycle infrastructure. And, and, and as a result, you know, so they have something more valuable in the, the cities will be more valuable than if they had invested the money in parking garages and car infrastructure. So, so I think it's, 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 it's that kind of pragmatic approach to say, are we producing more wealth with the, with the, with, with, with the resources we invest than what we had? And if not, we're building ourselves trap. And yeah, and there, and, and then we need to also mitigate the kind of the damages that we do. So that nothing can be done totally without impact. Uh, but we need to look at the net effect if it's really positive. And I'm not sure we are preparing ourselves fast enough. So the question, even for Paris, is the, Paris has prepared itself more with the bicycle path. I've been recently in Paris. That's quite amazing. But the question for any city is, why are you destroying yourselves? Because I don't see cities adjusting themselves fast enough to the future we can anticipate. Infrastructure is very slow moving um, and, and the future is coming very fast. Thank you, Matisse. Uh, we had a question at the back. That's me. Okay, I'm going to ask a slightly controversial question because I really Please. wonder your opinion. Uh, <laughs> what we've been trying to do with uh, in terms of changing the society up to now is really trying to persuade people. Do you think we've passed the point of persuasion and we need to apply more coercion and start banning stuff directly, like one one time plastic bottle uses non-electric cars? Because these sorts of solutions where we are trying to convince people away from these things is taking a very long time. And I really wonder if you think we have enough time to time to persuade enough people or we should just start using more force, social force, and start banning things and directly? I think it's a very important question you're, you're raising, how, how to act. I still believe we need to move, we need to focus on motivation, because if people are feel they're forced, they put all their energy in kind of fighting, fighting back. Um, I think the biggest liability we have is still that I haven't seen, apart from very, very few exceptions, economic development strategies, like for example, I'm from Switzerland, like their competitiveness plan that really builds on resource security. So as long as countries don't believe that they need to be resource secure, how can we even make a transformation happen? Like all the, like you look at the World Economic Forum's competitiveness index, there's they have 100, indice, 100 indicators in there. Not one of them is anything of resources, environment, um, water, anything. It's all about, do you have airports, do you have, phone lines, can you open businesses, can you fire people? So, so I think deep down, we don't believe that resource security is fundamental for our country's ability to operate. And I say our countries, all countries, 
I don't distinguish in any country. Some have higher income, some have lower income. All countries depend on resource security. And I think in Switzerland, where I come from originally, we have the illusion that we have high incomes. We can always get that money. But Switzerland's income vis-a-vis -vis other countries has actually vanished about 30 to 40% over the last 30 years because like incomes are rising more quickly in China and Brazil, et cetera. So, 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 so that's the first thing, our narrative. Are we convincingly telling the story that resource security is really essential and we need to prepare our countries to be able to operate in the future we can anticipate. So that narrative is missing. Now, in terms of coercion, I think, I mean, what uh, th th there are, there are certain types, once the narrative works, there can be some coercive ways that build a bigger sense of solidarity. I think there was a big, the, the, the politicians in Europe missed out in the Ukraine war crisis early on by believing we cannot have rationing. You know? So because rationing looks like an imposition. I see rationing as a as a as an element of building solidarity. Because if we say, look, we are in an economic war, <laughs> we can be smarter than the others. Let's be careful with our resources. Let's find ways to move it down and do it in a fair way that everybody can, can contribute. I think people would stand up to this chance and say, yeah, it's fair. I want to participate. That's a good idea. We'll outsmart the others. And there's a sense of solidarity. If there's no such thing, and I make an effort to take a cold shower or shower less or whatever, and my neighbor doesn't do it, it just produces cynicism and erodes a sense of solidarity and goodwill. So I think we are too shy to actually tell that while we depend on resources, we need to manage them carefully and let's do it together. And I think if we had such mechanisms, people would step up to the plate much, much more significantly. Thank you, Matisse. Um, one more question. Uh, I hope my question is not redundant because I came late, but uh, Gaël Giraud, uh, one time chief economist of AFD, I know. Mm -hmm. used to refer to your graph, I believe it's the graph uh, you referred to, uh, saying, well, all the countries are outside the box, except one. Guess which one? I said, it's not Cuba. Anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> not anymore, yes, because not apparently anymore. Cuba uh, left because of the warming up of the trade with the United States. Uh, so what do you have to say to that, including, the, of course, the governance of, of that country? Is that, it was Cuba 10 years ago or 15 years ago a model for post-development? I remember we did a workshop in Kenya and the Dean of Natural Resources looked at the graph and, say, and, and looked and said, Cuba, oh, not bad. You know? So it's a bit of a question of perspective. So, so we're not saying being in the box, like, so, so obviously people strive to have high human development. That's what kind of, that's what we experience. And if we can do it on depleting the planet and then see the consequences, we don't care about that side. We're just saying, if we want to have lasting prosperity, because the choice really is between one planet prosperity and one planet misery. That's the choice, not between one planet misery and seven planet, and not between one planet prosperity and seven planet prosperity. That's not that's not really the choice. So if you want to have an, an economic system that is robust and can operate, there are these physical constraints to say, yes, we want to have high human development, but we have to find it in a way that fits within the biophysical budget if we want to have a chance of having, you know, um, so the fact that countries still move away from it is very concerning. Also the paper on the SDGs. The SDGs currently still are negatively correlated with environmental sustainability. So they mimic still that curve that move away from that box because the SDGs are too weakly defined. So this is not a moral, I mean, it has moral implications, obviously. But it just shows that countries don't take the resource security dimension very seriously, believing that somehow they can buy themselves out of the problem. But on average, we cannot. And, and even high income countries will, like, it, 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 it's, it's a disruption scenario because the market doesn't react. And, and, and even high income countries also will be exposed to these disruptions. So, so I think it's economically unwise not to organize our policies in this direction. If I was the head of the World Bank, for example, I would put this map that you talked about on the wall and, 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 and ask anybody who runs a project, how is your project moving us in this box? Because if not, 
we are building ourselves traps, not opportunities. Thank you, Mathis. Uh, the last question uh, for the day. Thank you so much. I'm Stefan Batu for the, of the consulting firm uh, IFA Office. And uh, I would like uh, to have a question about uh, if uh, enterprise have to change their ways on their pattern, the, what the, will be the impact of the, the growth of GDP? And uh, you have some country where the GDP is not very high and the GDP has to, has to be uh, more important, the growth of GDP has to be more important than the growth of uh, demography. And do, if they reduce the, 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 you have the degrees of GDP more important than, and became more, imp what would be the impact of the poverty if the GDP will go very down and the demography go very low, if they go very high, the impact of poverty. And uh, on the other part, if you have uh, enterprise, you have to be sustainable, uh, sustained by the public. What do you think about public-private partnership? The public have to sustain more than enterprise or not, and what will be, will be the impact of that if the public sustain very highly the enterprise? Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, again, he's kind of, I think you're, you're framing a whole new conference theme <laughs> to, to, to cover. I would say the following, I'm agnostic around GDP, I would say. I think we need to focus on wealth rather than income because producing income at the cost of wealth makes us poor. Poor and rich is a wealth concept. We need to focus on, are we building strength to be able to maintain flows now and in the future. So that's kind of the question of wealth. Is our wealth getting stronger? And I would measure wealth in terms of the, of, of the various aspects. One key ingredient of wealth is, do you have the resource security available? If we, de if, if, if we produce development strategies that lead to less resource security, particularly for people who are low in their income, it's it's an incredible tragedy because they won't have enough resources for themselves and they won't be able to buy those resources. So any development strategy that doesn't build more resource security is to the detriment of that population in, in, in my case. So, so, so a wealth framework is much more helpful, I believe, to then choose where to intervene. And, and in, 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 in practical ways, I mean, like, for example, I mean, this is more as an implication, what I think is, is necessary. I think <clears throat> rural areas are, don't have enough leverage to get part of the value chain in, captured in the rural areas. So I see, for example, electrification, particularly solar power, decentralized electrification of rural areas as very core to development strategy if you want to maintain value add in the rural areas because otherwise if farmers just have to produce they can only sell once the product is ready they they cannot dictate the price they get very poor prices and very little value add stays in those communities so again i think we have to focus far more on wealth and also look at that wealth in much more physical terms because the market is absolutely blind to the significance of regeneration as our materially most limiting factor Thank you very much, Matisse. Um, I think we'll have to... This um, is the graph. Just, yeah. Yes, a very interesting yeah. graph. And, and indeed, uh, we can still see that uh, Cuba in here is, uh, yeah. is in the magical square. Actually, this, this, this dot is not Cuba. It's, it, it's, a, it's a mistake that we should take out. It was, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. it, it was, it's Uruguay here, but Uruguay is it's a mistake in the footprint calculation. Okay. So, yeah, okay, well, no hope then. Um, okay, so no, well, there's, I, hope. there's hope, but we, we need, <laughs> indeed, we need to pursue the goal, then there's hope. But if you don't pursue the goal, then no. <laughs> All right. So, so, so I, I now have to um, to try to wrap up the the two days of uh, academic conferences that that we've had in fifty nine seconds. Uh, if I don't want to have trouble with uh, everyone uh, organizing this conference, so so uh, I'll I'll be very quick. Uh, no, I mean the 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 goal of the conference uh, for the AFD uh, was to say, okay, how can we design tools? policies, financial instruments that can help us in achieving a truly sustainable world. Um, and, and what we decided to do was to say, 
can we have guiding principles that can help us in designing these tools, instruments, and, and helping us is in thinking about possible future. And this is why we decided to embrace uh, the, the strong sustainability approach. Uh, and, and the conference here is the beginning point of our, um, our thinking. Um, uh, we, uh, we come with, with more questions than answers out of these two days. Uh, tomorrow we'll have more questions about policy implication and financial aspects, but, but the, the work will continue uh, for the next year and, and well, actually years, I should say. Uh, it's clear that, that we haven't finished uh, the, the debates here, and so I wanted to thank everyone uh, that has participated, uh, either physically uh, in Paris or online. We had a lot of uh, different uh, uh, participants online. I want to thank all of the uh, keynote speakers and parallel session speakers. Uh, I think it was extremely rich. I am personally exhausted, and not because I haven't slept, because I think it was so stimulating. Uh, I, think, I think every se session I attended was uh, brilliant and, and led to extremely interesting questions and I can see I'm going over the 59 seconds so so I'll stop here no anyway uh, I, I really want to thank everyone for this uh, uh, these two inch exciting days we, we're gonna have a cocktail not for you Matisse I'm sorry um, you, you'll have to uh, <laughs> not enjoy the beautiful food and we will see each other tomorrow exactly <laughs> and we will see each other tomorrow uh, in a different venue uh, at uh, La Maison de la RATP. Uh, and this is uh, where we will find uh, for the final day on, on policy discussions. Again, thanks everyone for being here and um, let's meet in the, in the cocktail.